Elona uh, cares with her an anointing and an authority, and, and I don't want to embarrass you, so don't take it personally, but, but a, an anointing and an authority that is rarely seen, no matter where you go in the world. And uh, so I just want you to receive the gift of God that he is sharing with us today. Pastor Elona Ploy from Tirana, Albania, Skoda, Albania. Amen. Amen. You know what I was thinking? I wish to be from Ghana. I like that. Hey! <laughs> Thank you so much. It's such a joy to be back home, to be here. It's, it's, it's a wonderful joy and a wonderful privilege that uh, I have not only to come here and share the word of God, but share bread, relationship, fellowship, and the love of God together. We are the same family from different nations. And one day, we will be one nation in one place, face to face with our Savior. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, before starting this service, I was in the office of Pastor Don with uh, Sister Jadira. And uh, I was watching the, uh, the pictures in the wall. And it attracts my attention, one picture of Cesar Chavez. And uh, I was asking Sister Jadira about who is this man, and she was explaining me that he's a human rights activist about the farm workers and protecting their rights because they were paid lowly. But also another picture I saw, I saw his dad and himself, and to me, you know, when you see the heroes of people, you understand a lot about their character and who they are. So I saw Pastor Don's heroes there in the office. And I was thinking about the time that we are living. We are living in a, in a season that the likes and the followers in the social media are more important than the calling of God and the dreams that God are giving us. We are living in a time and a season when the young generations are so attracted from the fast gain, and the fast gain is more important than integrity and character. We are living in a season that having this fake relationship and virtual ones are more important than the relationship with God and relationships with each other. We are living in a season when generations, young generations, do not have any more heroes. They have influencers. The heroes are not so popular because they don't have the crowds following them. They are killed. And they are not recognized in the time they are living. They are recognized after some times when the time go by, goes by. And they don't live to see the fruits of their sacrifices. A time without heroes. And as we were speaking about the power of plumb line and what it means to be plumbed with Jesus Christ as the only plumb line of God, is we understand that the younger generations, they don't have examples and heroes. Influencers. What are the influencers? These are people that will bring things that you like, not things that you need. Influencers are, they are followed. They have a majority of people following them for a short period of time. Because they will speak what you like to hear. They will not speak what is uncommon and the truth. So this is why the influencers are the people that are impacting our children, but not heroes. Heroes are unpopular because they speak the truth. They stand up and sacrifice and give their life for justice and righteousness. They are thrown stones against them. And then when they are gone, we'll be, we build memorial with the stones they have, we have stoned them. We are living in a time like this. We are living in superficial relationships, not the deep ones. 
And it is such a big noise out there that we don't have a quiet moment that we can listen to the voice inside of here. The world is running fast. And there is noise. And we cannot listen and hear the voice of God inside of our hearts. And even if we hear the voice, we are so busy to obey. We are so busy. We hear the voice. I loved what the brother did here. Hearing the voice and just going and saying the word. Obeying there. Understanding that a de delayed obedience is disobedience. Understanding that when we hear the voice of the Lord and we make it rest in our natural body, we start to compromise that word. Because we want that to seem natural. Because people will think we are crazy. You know, about four years ago, God gave me a vision of going to the office of the president of the country and telling him that I respect him for the person he is, but I know that he has got human needs and I'm here to pray for you. And in the beginning, when I got this vision, I was like, God, what do you want me to do? And I hear the Lord saying to me, wait, wait, because the spoken word of God and the perfect will of God is not only the spoken word, is the right time, the right place, the right people. God spoke and he said to me, wait. And you know, I waited about eight months and I forgot about what God has spoken. Because of all busyness around us. I forgot about that. And eight months later, the wife of the president calls me and she says, can you come in my office? I need to talk to you. I've never met her. I go in her office. And then she shares her life with me. And I share Jesus with her. And in the end, I, say her, I told her that I'll be praying for you. And she said, thank you so much, thinking that, I will pray when I go home. But I said, no, I want to pray here. Let's pray here. And as we were praying, she was in tears in the presence of God. And in the end, she told me and she said, nobody has ever prayed in this place. Thank you. And then a month later, she calls me and she says, let's do a prayer breakfast in my house. So I go in her house and there... I meet the president in the living room, having coffee together. And in the end of all our time together, I give him my business card saying, I know you are my president and I respect you, but I know you are a human being and you have got needs. I'm here to pray for you. And when I sat, it was to me as a deja vu, like I've seen this somewhere I remembered, and to me, I was overwhelmed about the provision, the guidance, and how the Lord takes us in places we would never think or dream or even want to be. Amen. Heroes in our time, obedience and a radical obedience. You know, I want to read in the Word of God about a prophet. I love this prophet. We will read together in 1 Kings chapter 17. From verse 2 is, And the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah. Depart from him and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Kareth, which is east of Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. What he did? He went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook of Kareth, and that is east of Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, arise, go to Zephyrath which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zephyrath, Zarephath, 
And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did what Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. It is a beautiful word of God and story happened to this prophet of the Lord. Now let's understand that Elijah was living in the midst of people that were worshipping again Baal. It was a similar story when we know about Amos, where we were speaking and talking these three days about prophet Amos. The situation was almost the same. The people of God has forgotten the Lord and they went to worship Baal. They went to worship the almighty dollar, the almighty gold, the almighty silver. And they have forgotten to worship their own God the Lord of Israel. And God said to Elijah that for three and a half years there will not be rain in the earth. And as there will be starvation, God is guiding and leading Elijah that he may not die, but go through that, not only to survive, but to be used by God. Church of God, in difficult times, you are not called to survive. You are not called to go through starvation, wars, and inflation or whatever is happening. You are called not only to go through that, but allow God to use you, help even other people, and bring in transformation in the community. Amen? So, Elijah got a good news and a bad news. So the good news was that God was taking him out of Kareth and the bad news was going to Zephariah. Now this means like he's going from bad to worse. And sometimes we always say after rain there, is, there will be sun, but not always. After the rain it might be snow. And here Elijah is going from one place that he's, th he's thinking is bad, in another place that he is even worse. He will not consider these two places as his safe haven. No, these were foreigner places that Elijah has to run as a man wanted for about 70 to 100 miles away. And being sent to these places because God spoke to him and he obeyed. God said to him first, go to Kareth and I will feed you with ravens and I will give you water from the brook there. Now ravens were an unclean bird in Israel and for him to be there and take bread from ravens and meat from ravens in a time of starvation it was weird. Not only because ravens were an unclean birds, bird, but there has been so many dead bodies that they could have taken the meat and bring the meat to Elijah. It was starvation. 
And it was so bad that in the word of God says that the mothers in these lands were killing their babies and eating the meat of their babies. So why should we not believe that the, the ravens would take the meat and give that meat to Elijah? But the presence of bread, where can the ravens find bread in a time of starvation? Nowhere. If the starvation was so bad that they could have eaten their own children, there was no bread to be found. The presence of bread to the ravens was a sign that they were supernatural equipped to feed Elijah. Amen? Supernatural equipment to feed Elijah. If it was only meat, ooh, I doubt if it would have been good to eat. But the presence of bread was a sign that God was bringing to the ravens to bring and feed Elijah. And the water, the brook, and the water there. Spiritual speaking, God has promised us that he will feed us with the bread of the word. And he will feed us and, and uh, fulfill our thirst with river of living water that will flow from inside of us. This is the picture that I see in nowadays that God has promised, I'll feed you with my word and I will, I will fulfill your thirst with the water of my Holy Spirit. You know, but then Elijah hears another word from the Lord that says, go up and go to this other place. Now, Elijah could have stayed there forever and asking God that this brook will not dry, never dry. But as he is staying there, the scholars will say that he stayed there for a year. And he was fed for a year in the morning and in the evening by the ravens. And he would go to this brook and take the water. Now imagine there was dryness everywhere. But God made that this stream will not run dry until when he says so. Now, sometimes in our lives, we think that when the streams dry, we are against the will of God. Elijah did what God was asking him to do, and still, the brook and the streams dry were dry. Is this a sign that he's against the will of God? No. It is not. The stream dried because God was taking Elijah to the next place. And God does this because he doesn't want us to be connected with the gifts, but with the gifter. God does not want us to be dependent on earthly things, but in heavenly things. As human beings, we have the tendency... That if we have got something, we have got a house, we have got a salary, we have got a car, we have got a phone, we have got our children. Oh, we have our safe haven here. And we get so comfortable in this place and nobody can do us something because we are okay. We have a kind of, some, some types of financial comfortable place, f a familiar comfortable place, social comfortable place, and then we don't need God anymore. We have everything we need and we don't need God. And this is what I see in America. The God of America, materialism and consumism. And when we have it all, we don't need God. And then we try to find out and bring all these other types of things that are crazy. We are inventing humanity again. We are inventing humans, genders and all this other stuff because... We are connected to the God of materialism and consumism. We have everything. We don't need God. God made the stream dry for Elijah to not be dependent on the stream, but being dependent on God. 
Amen. God who would have provided the stream to flow for the whole three and a half years. And Elijah would have been there, hiding there. But no, God said, no, now it's time. Come up and let's go to Zarephath. From one bad place to the worst one. Let's go there. And there God is saying to Elijah that there will be a widow feeding you. Now, God, when you are taking me to a bad place, make sure that I meet the prime minister, the president, or some politicians in that place, that they might have some food after one and a half years of starvation. A widow that doesn't have a husband with an only son? A poor one living in a Gentile place? Can't you do it better? What did Elijah do? He rose up and he obeyed the word of the, of the Lord. You know, I want to go together through five processes that a radical obedience takes. Radical obedience, not natural understanding. Radical obedience. God is not calling his people to understand him. God is calling his people to obey him. And to obey him radically, not naturally understanding. You know, we are limited. We are limited in our understanding. We are limited in our presence. We are limited in our time. But we are un in unlimited in one dimension. Trusting an unlimited God. There is no borders. There is no measures of trusting. You can, you can trust the Lord and you can have the faith of heaven. Do you know the word of God says that sometimes when they were lacking faith, God will give his faith. You have the capacity of trusting the Lord and having the faith of heaven. There you are unlimited. You are not unlimited in your understanding. You are not unlimited in your presence. You are not unlimited in your time. You can live in one place at one time and understand as much understanding as you have. But you are unlimited to trust the unlimited God. That has an unlimited capacity of understanding. That can be everywhere at the same time. And is all powerful. Amen. All powerful. So what are these five processes of radical obedience? First, God's guidance and your obedience includes your purification. Your obedience and God's guidance will include your cleansing and purification. Why does God need us to take in a foreign land to purify us, to clean us? And to work and transform in us. Why God, does God need to take us in valleys, in darkness, in times of difficulties, in painful times for him in order to transform us? You know, I have experienced the top of the mountains, the very best with the Lord. And I have experienced the deepest valleys, the valley of death. And I would not trade my valley of death with any top of the mountains ever. I would not trade the valleys of death. Because there is the place that I can feel the touch of the Father that is giving me shape, transforming me, cleaning me, and saying to me, I'm here. I'm here. It is in the darkness that he will show us the treasures of life. It is in the darkness when treasures will shine the most. It is in the painful time when he will expand our cup and he will fill the cup with more presence of his spirit. It is in the darkness and in the painful time when he will pour the oil of his spirit, not only to heal us, but to clean us, restore us, and transform us. Amen? Don't be afraid of darkness. Don't be afraid of valleys. Don't be afraid of painful times. 
You know, when people ask me about pain, I say, hug it and let it transform you. Hug it and let it transform you. Let it expand your cup. You know, when I lost my husband, in fact, I gained my husband in heaven. Twelve years ago, the first thing that God spoke to me, it was, this is not your grieving year. This is the grieving year of the church. You have to be here and help the church to grieve. They are younger than you, spiritually. And I was there for a year, denying everything that has happened. Because I wanted to be close to the church. I became the pastor two weeks after he was killed. I had my two little babies and here is another baby and go on. Bring on your pieces and walk. I obeyed because I didn't have a choice. I was lost. And after a year that the church grieved, God said to me, this is your time and your children time. And I was ready. I didn't want to deny anymore. I was ready to grieve. But then God says to me, but you will not grieve here. Take everything you have and move from this place. Everything here that you have, the emotional, the social, the material resources are fake. All you need is me. Take everything and leave the place. You know, sharing this with my kids, they both started to cry. Mom, we have lost dad and now we are, we are losing everything. Church, family, familiar place, a place where we knew our comfort place. But to me, it was like, we will obey God. Let's go on and we will obey God. So he took us out at that time. And as we were walking through the valley of death and our grieving process, God gave me a beautiful picture of a refiner refining gold. You know, the time when the flames are so hot, there is the time of purification. And I read the story of a woman going to a golden shop and she was asking for a ring. And the refiner said, I'm sorry, I cannot serve you now. And she said, why? He said, I need to make sure, because I'm refining gold, I need to make sure to stay there, have my eyes on the gold, to make sure that the fire is not too hot because it will destroy the elements, not too cold because it will keep the impurities there. I need to make sure that it is the right fire. And she asked and she said, when do you know that the, the gold is refined? And the refiner said, when my face is reflected in the gold, I know it is time to take it out. You know, if God is taking you through the fire, the thermometer of the fire is his love. Remember that. Remember that. The thermometer of his fire is love. And when he has worked in you, cleaned you, he will take you out and then he will use you. If I didn't obey that voice at that year, I know 100%, 1,000%, I'm sure I would have never been here today. But it took that obedience for God to transform me, to make and to, to become ashes, and then build up again from the fire. Sometimes I still smell fire. <sighs> But not of those, those ashes, but his spirit, his spirit. Amen. So the process of obedience, the first process include purification. Don't go away from pain. Walk through that and find God that there. Amen. Walk through the valley and find God in the valley. The second thing, God's guidance often comes step by step, one step at a time. So we still need to obey come on now we would love to see the big picture 
We love to know where we are going. We want to know our destination. Because for us, it is so important the destination, but for God, it's more important the process to the destination than the destination. We can be in destination and we can be destroyed because we have not got the character, the calling, the standing. For God, not only destination is important, the process to go to the destination. This is why he's showing step by step. When he calls Elijah, come out and says to him, go to Kareth. Elijah didn't know that after this, there will be chapter 17, 18, that he will face the, the, the prophet of Baal. 450 prophets. He didn't know that. And sometimes, sometimes God protects us from the big pictures because that can be overwhelming for us. But also sometimes he protects us from the big pictures because we can be proud and we don't need him anymore. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. I don't need you, God. So he guides one step at a time. Obey. God was guiding Elijah from one interesting and strange situation to another more interesting and more strange situation. To one place that he was somehow alone. To another place in the midst of the prophets of Baal. He had to obey one step at a time. It is a walk of faith. And this is why God is doing this for us. Because he doesn't want to, us to be independent. He wants us to be dependent on him. Not dependent on earthly thing. Dependent on him. The third thing. While we obey, God is at work. While we obey, God is at work. Divinely pulling together whether we realize it or not, pulling everything together. As we obey, he still is working. You know, when Jesus told the disciples about feeding the 5,000 people, men and women and children, others, he told them, what do you have? And there was this, this little boy with fish, little fish and little bread. And Jesus said, give it to me. He prayed, and then as they were spreading, the bread and fish was multiplying. It takes our obedience to see that God is working to multiply every resource he has given to us. Imagine if the disciple will say to Jesus, don't put us in shame, please. <laughs> multiply at least for the first 100 and then let's see what it happened. They obeyed. They walked in faith. They obeyed there. So one step at a time, and God is pulling together. What happened to Elijah? So he arose, he went to Zarephath, and then when he came to the gate of the city, there was the widow. Suddenly, accidentally, nope. God has brought her to welcome in the, in, the, in the gates of the city to welcome the prophet of God. So she do, just does, didn't happen there in the gate, but it was a divine appointment of God. Not only God works in your life, but he will work and will pull together even the life of other people to make his plan a reality in your life. Amen. And why God did use this woman? You know, like when Jesus speaks to his disciples about how they will be persecuted, Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own town. But in truth, I tell to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and the great famine came all over the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were many widows in Israel, but Elijah was sent there. 
Elijah was sent there because this woman was honest. How do we see her honesty? When Elijah tells her, bring me some water, you know, if you live in, in our areas there, if a stranger asks you for water, you give water. But then when Elijah says to her, bring me some bread, she says, as truly as your God lives, your God, not my God. This is showing that God has given her the gift of faith, that she believed that the God of Israel is the only true God. She was not only honest, but she was given the gift of faith. She was saying, as surely as your God lives, I don't have only one piece of flour and a little oil that we can have the last meal and die. But then when Elijah told her and said, go and prepare that, do what you, say, you have said, but bring a cake to me first, she obeyed. She chose the tough and difficult path of sacrificing, loving, and faith, and obedience. She was not dealing with herself about, or, or the man of God saying, hey, what are you doing? Uh, my son will be dead. She was not eating her son. She was feeding her son the last meal. But first she did what the prophet of God said. She obeyed. So God is working everything together for his wonderful plan. Even those things and situations that seem tragic. He's working everything together for his plan to come to pass. And then the other thing, the, the, the fifth thing is guide, God guidance and your obedience may include people or places that are not like you and you don't like. You don't like. And sometimes he will do exactly that. People you don't like places you want to go, they are the, the, the ones that God will involve in fulfilling in his plan in your life. So what is happening here? Elijah is called to a strange and foreign place and a widow, strange thing, a widow, a poor widow to feed him. It cannot be worse than that. <laughs> Remember, we cannot put God in a box. God, if you cannot come in this way, I know it is not you. God will include people of different color, financial status, educational level, culture, lifestyle, live by different values. God will include them to fulfilling the calling in you. Your Zarephath may even involve going to dangerous places. May even involve that because... Elijah will not choose that place. That was a dangerous place for him. Dangerous places. But we think that if it's dangerous, it must not be God. If it's risky and unsafe, if it's costly, it's not the will of God. What if these factors are the sign that this is the will of God? We are living in a battlefield, not in a playground. Be prepared for that. We are living in a battlefield, not a playground. Jesus said to his disciple, behold, Matthew 10, 16, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise, wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Can a dangerous, more dangerous place be for a sheep to be in the midst of the wolves? Yeah, I'm sending you in a place as sheep in the midst of the wolves. And we can see that even for some people being here today may be that place, the midst of wolves as a sheep. So be prepared about that. That places can be dangerous, people you don't like, God will include them in fulfilling the calling that he has in you. Jesus goes on and he tells his disciples also, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And also Paul, Paul says, this is one of my favorite verses. It is graved and it is written in the gravestone of my husband. And it's for me to live is Christ and to die is victory. Yeah. 
is gain. To die is gain. So be prepared. Be prepared about dangerous places. Be prepared about people you don't like. Maybe this is the way God is working. And I'm closing with this. Our obedience includes his provision. Amen. The resources must equal the mission. Yeah? Military here. The resources must equal the mission. Our obedience will include his provision. God is providing for Elijah. You don't need somebody else to tell you about the things and the resources around you. When God is calling you obey, he will provide for you. He will equip you with everything you need. For every season, he equipped Elijah. Amen? For every season. Let me end with this story. While in Serbia, serving with TFI Symposium there, after the service, I was praising the Lord in that beautiful worship that you saw even in the video here. As worshiping, I see a vision of Mark, Tani's killer, hugging Tani. And as I see this vision, I was asking God, God, what does this mean? And God told me that it is your duty that if Mark met Tani in an environment when darkness won, they can meet again in an environment when light always overcomes. And then I was so touched. And to me it was a mission that this is what God is calling me to do. Then two weeks later in a conference, there was a pastor coming to me and he said, Pastor Elona, I want to talk to you. And I said, what, what is there? And he said, I want to talk about the family of the killer of your husband. And he asked me, he said, is it true that you have forgiven? And I said, the sign that they are free means that they are forgiven. And he said, I want to tell you something. And I said, what? He said, Mark is out of prison. And I asked him, I said, when? He told me on the Sunday and the time that God gave me the vision. God equips and provides for every season. God equips and provides for every season. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Hallelujah. Dear God, we want to thank you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. Father, give us, give us the, the strength and the desire to radically be obedient to your word. As you listen your voice, we will obey to your voice. And God, if you are stirring inside people here, the desire to hear your voice. And as you are telling them, be ready, be ready. I want to purify you. God is saying, be thankful. Because he has chosen you to fulfill his purpose. Be attentive. He will provide and equip for, for every task he has given to you. Be open. He may lead you out of your comfort zone and with people that you don't like. He goes before you. He goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Thank you, Lord. And in all this, Father, thank you that you are not a God who leaves us alone. You lead us. You guide us. You equip us. You provide for us. And you allow us to have the privilege and the blessing of serving you. Thank you that as you do this in this wonderful church, I pray that your son will be glorified. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen.